Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and call the Metro meeting to, for September 27th to order. Can we have begin with the roll call? Here. Thank you. Uh, today, our, our Spanish interpreter will be Mindy Esqueda, and I'd like her to come up and make a brief announcement uh, for anybody that needs assistance. Good morning. I'm Mindy Esqueda. I'll be the interpreter here today. Buenos días. Soy Mindy Esqueda. Estoy aquí para su servicio para como intérprete hoy. Gracias. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, if you want to make a comment today during any communication to the board, there are comment cards in the back that you can fill out, and then that way we'll know that you want to speak. Today's meeting is broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz. Our technician today is Mr. Kingston Rivera. Thank you for your service. Uh, there will be no items discussed in closed sessions. We'll have no closed session today, so we'll move to the uh, next item, which will be uh, Board of Directors comments. Any comments from the Board of Directors? Okay, none. Any uh, oral or written communications to the Board? Now, the written, this is now time for oral communications. This is if you want to come up and speak on something that is not on the agenda. Oh, Marilyn. Morning. My name is Raquel Spalding, and I'm here just to read a letter um, from Marilyn Garrett to Isaac Hawley from the Santa Cruz Metro. Let me see if. Yeah, there you go. Thank uh, you. Already, thank you. <clears throat> um, we have had several conversations about the biological harm caused by exposure to our radio frequency microwave radiation over the last couple of years, and I sent you some uh, literature. In substantiation, um, bus drivers and riders should be in a healthy environment, not exposed to wireless radiation, which in May uh, 2011, the um, was categorized as a class 2B carcinogen in the same category as lead, DDT, benzene, etc. Such toxic exposure violates right to health and accommodation. I took no notes on, on our most recent um, phone dialogue on 8-22-19 when you informed me of the new um, sy I'm sorry, synchromatic AVL system which transmits with the Verizon 4G LTE poles on Freedom Boulevard in Aptos and elsewhere. You have been informed of the documented damage to health and yet you install a system that increases such dangerous radiation exposure. No one has authorized informed consent. Um, so, um, thank you, Marilyn Garrett. And then there's just some common symptoms of microwave sickness. And that would be uh, in the brain, there would be headaches, insomnia, concentration, memory problems. In the ears, you can have tinnitus, humming, pain, skin rash, and on the skin, skin rash, mood ir irritability, depression, anxiety. And the eyes, um, eye twitching, deteriorating vision, the heart it could be palpitations, chest pain, breathing, um, blood, blood pressure issues, and that's, and others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, Marilyn. Good morning. I've been here many times and seen you in different positions on city council, school boards, et cetera. So you have been supplied with data on the biological harm of exposure to microwave radiation. And if some of you have seen Dr. Sharon Goldberg, a medical doctor testifying against 5G, she talks about 
major illnesses we're seeing that are linked to these exposures, diabetes, heart problems, mental health issues, including the suicide rates. And I, do any of you ride the bus? I haven't seen you on the bus. I ride the bus and I get on with my detector of microwave radiation and it's way up to the top. And in the conversation with, Mike, uh, with uh, Isaac Hawley, he told me this new system that Rachel referred to in my letter transmits with the 4G antennas on the poles, on the utility poles. There are about six of them along Freedom Boulevard. So you are exposing everyone to additional microwave radiation with this automatic vehicle location, it's called, which operates by microwaves. So here are these lovely in-training bus drivers, and they are being exposed all the time as the equipment is in the cabinet behind the driver's seat and the transmission is going on all, all the time. I think this is a union issue, a workplace issue of health and safety. Microwaves are not safe. And to impose this on the public and the drivers, and there's no informed consent, I think is not only unconscionable, but it, to me it seems abusive. Now, if we, you all remember, or many of you, when there was smoking everywhere. I lived in Berkeley in the 60s, and the co-op stores are smoking over the food. Secondhand smoke, secondhand radiation, both the user and the non-user are harmed. With smoking, you can see it and smelling, smell it. But this is an invisible type of assault. Nonetheless, it's well documented. And I am calling for this to be removed. As a frequent bus driver, I'm discouraged from riding the bus. Thank, Thank you, Marilyn. You. Anyone else like to address us on something that's not on the agenda? Go ahead and close oral communication. Is there any written communication from the MAC? Okay, hey, time for labor or organization communications. Anyone from labor like to address us at this point? Morning. Okay. My name's Olivia Martinez. I'm the internal organizer and um, good morning to all. As you know, um, our members did not pass the last best and final that management proposed on Tuesday of last week. I think it's important for you guys to understand um, that that wasn't really true negotiations when there is no dialogue at the table and we are just given a last best and final. That is not good faith negotiations. So let me tell you what happened. Our members were given the boot allowance. We had a verbal agreement, right? That we agreed on the amount that our members were gonna get. Then for the last couple of months, we've agreed on the 5% below medium CPS recommendation. So a lot of our members, Maybe that way yeah. so a lot of our members have been looking at those percentages, right? And our main big issue has been the red line folks, right? And the calm time. Because we agreed to give away the borrowing of the PTO. We agreed to paying more into the medical. We've agreed to all of that. So we were also told, we think members should have an increase to uniforms because they haven't received an increase for many years. And other members that are not getting uniforms should get them. So they were giving these carrots, right? Show your carrots, workers. They were dangled these carrots. 
And there was a verbal agreement at the table that this is what they were going to get. And these folks over here said, you're not getting anything. You're redlined, right? So then management, this last negotiation says, we're taking this, we're taking this, give me your carrots, and I'm giving them to these workers. And the workers are angry, upset at Mr. Clifford's leadership. And we were not able to counter at their proposal because it was the last, best, and final. We heard we were going to be given different, different options. At the table, I told Mr. Glenn, this is regressive bargaining. He says, I know, I know. But it's something different we're trying to do. And I go, oh, I've never heard an attorney agree with the labor that this is regressive bargaining. So now I have three attorneys of our law firm looking at all the proposals. But let me tell you why members are more upset about this. They are upset because last week there was an emergency at the Pacific Station and there where there was gas. I sent an email to Mr. Clifford, no response until Wednesday. I filed two OSHA complaints. Have they received an email? No. To say, you're okay, you're safe. There is also a shooting. Are you safe? Are you okay? Do you need counseling? No. There was also bad faith negotiations when I was running around with Aaron trying to get the project's coordinator's position. We signed off on it. This young man that his wife just had a baby was told, most likely you're going to get the position. Angela comes and says, just two weeks. Aaron was there for like 18 years, so I don't know how many years. Says, no, I'm taking it away. I don't think we need this position. And this young man turned out offers, other offers, because he was wishing he was going to get this position. This is what happens at Metro all the time. These leaders do this all the time to our workers. And you have to get involved. You have to understand, and I'm coming to every single board meeting to tell you that there's always these kinds of situations happening of bad faith negotiations and where we're told one thing and then taken away. And this is why our members rejected that proposal because there's something awful happening at Metro and you need to get involved. Thank you. Thank you. We turn that microphone off. I think it's. <laughs> I'm just going to turn off that remote mic. Welcome. Good morning, board members. Um, I just want to say thank you for your support and uh, having open dialogue with me during our contract negotiations and we reached that final agreement. However, I do want to... <laughs> Killing me, Gene. <laughs> but I do want to say that we have a few outstanding issues to, that have yet to be resolved, and um, they're minor issues, but we're still ironing them out right now. And I think it was because we're my first time going through it in mediation, we're relying on a third party perspective, what intentions are, but behind what was agreed on, it's not a, you know, we, we try to get a gotcha moment or anything like that. It's more like we intended one thing to be one way and they intended one thing to be another way. So is everything completely done? I don't know yet, but we're still working it out. I'm having open dialogue with Alex. so. I just wanted to bring it to your attention that we're still trying to iron out the, the wrinkles of contract negotiations, but also give you guys acknowledgement and say thank you very much for your support. So thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Appreciate that. Good morning, Joan. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to say that I am, <coughs> I am really disappointed that we were not at an agreement we were really, really hoping that we would be there. And when we went into negotiations last week, 
Um, at first, things seemed pretty promising. We were told that the district had reevaluated the parts staff, for example, and they had been pretty badly redlined. And after this reevaluation, realizing that they actually do a vast number of duties that are above, above and beyond what other part staff do, the district <clears throat> decided to benchmark them a little bit lower than our buyer because they do some of the functions of the buyer. So that was fabulous. Um, we were so pleased with that. They also agreed no more redlining. And that was huge. That was so important. Um, the problem is, is at the very end, we feel like we were thrown a huge curveball. And it wasn't expected. And it, on top of that, it doesn't really make any sense. It really doesn't. It's not logical. Um, I would be happy. I don't want to take a lot of time here. I would be happy. I understand the process of how the district came to this final offer and the changes that they made. But like I said, I, we do not believe that they make sense. Um, I would be happy to go over in more detail with any of you uh, later. But I did bring a couple of uh, pieces of paper I wanted to give to Gina to pass out. And this shows the history of just one group, the transit supervisors and the training coordinator positions. There's an assistant training coordinator and then the one above it, the main training coordinator. Now, they were not grouped together in a series originally. Uh, the, the vendor benchmarked the training uh, transit soups individually, and they benchmarked the training coordinators individually. Uh, however, there is a report, there's a, uh, what do you, uh, letter. letter. It's a letter. It's a promotional path that the transit soups can take. It would make sense to put them together, but we didn't do that at the, at the beginning. And so the end result um, is that the, they are trying to force these positions into a ladder for which there is no place. The vendor recommended a specific ladder. Uh, these are levels within a series that different positions can fall in. So you have like an admin series, you have a mechanic series. Um, each of these levels, they recommend a specific spread in between them, the percentage of the difference in between. And uh, the problem with having a transit supervisor that is a supervisor and then the two coordinators above that position, they're all supervisors. There is no allowance in this model for three supervisors. That's where the problem came in. The first way that this was addressed was simply to give a nice, even 10% spread in between these three positions. That was here. That was the district district's last best and final. Sorry, that was here in August. Everybody thought that worked out really well. What they've done this time instead is decided that no, we need to slot these three positions, force them to fit into this scenario. There is no place for three supervisors. Therefore, we are going to say that the transit soup is actually a journey level. Journey levels don't supervise. And there's a 20% spread between the journey level and the supervisor one. So now they've increased this spread dramatically between the transit soup and the transit soups, 11 of them, and his position and Leo's position above. Now, because that increased spread meant that these two training coordinator positions, salaries went super high. They said, oops, we're gonna lower the transit suit salary, so that these other two don't go so high. So what the transit soups were told from the beginning when this class and comp first came out back in May, that the district kept saying, vendor recommendation, table nine, that's what's shown here. Transit soups were getting almost a 9% increase, okay? That's what they have felt they were going to get since May. Now, at the last minute, they're told, no, our last, best, and final to you is that you're getting half of that. All these 11 transit soups are now only getting half of that original increase. Worse than that, the two positions above are getting even more of an increase than they were getting here. So that's expecting Michael, the PSA chapter leader, to go back to his members and tell them, guess what? All of the transit soups are now getting half of their expected increase. 
And me and Leo are getting more. You put Michael in an impossible situation. It was horrible for him. Okay, it didn't have to be that way. It doesn't make logical sense. If the vendor's methodology doesn't fit, you adapt it. You do what makes sense. This does not make sense for anybody. Thank you, Joan. Any other labor organization communication? Okay. Um, move on. Let me, let me. I want to thank um, both of the units and the various people who spoke to us for the tenor of the comments. They're important. I think we got important information. And it's much easier for us to hear it when it's delivered as it was this morning. Thank you very much. Good comments. Thank you, Michael. Okay, that takes us on to our consent agenda. These are items we normally deal with in one motion. Is there anybody who'd like to pull anything on the consent agenda? Dr. Matthews. 1301. No one. Do we need to pull that for, or do you have a yeah, quick? Yeah, I want to we're going to pull it. Okay, we're going to pull that. And uh, depending on the public hearing, I'm going to put that in uh, Whatever you want. right now. Let's just say uh, I'm going to do it at uh, 21A. Consent. And that is uh, 1301. Okay, 13. Any members from the public like to make a comment on anything on the consent agenda? Seeing that Approval of the consent agenda. Motion for consent. Second. Second, Second by McPherson. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Against? That motion carries unanimously. Um, we got time for this. We're going to go on to the presentation of longevity awards on the regular agenda. Uh, who do we have here of the uh, people that are receiving awards? It's, it's on the list here. The name here. It's highlighted. Okay. Okay. Good. So, okay. Go ahead. We also have five. Whereas our board chair is going to go out and make the actual presentations. Um, one of the people receiving the award is um, Candace Almanza, uh, paratransit supervisor. She's not here this morning. Um, and this is. Um, and then we have uh, Melody Martin, customer service representative, <coughs> excuse me, who's also not attending. Um, Sandra Howard, customer service representative, is here this morning. Sandra is also being honored for 15 years of service, as were the other two, uh, with Santa Cruz Metro. Like so many of our customer service representatives, Sandra started with Paracruz as a reservationist before merging with the Metro call center several years ago. Sandra says the best thing about her time with Metro has been developing a relationship with her coworkers. She particularly enjoys celebrating occasions with her regular customer service potlucks. When Sandra's not working, she enjoys house painting as a hobby. I, I, I got some stuff for you to do. Um, <laughs> Sandra would like to recognize all the Metro drivers who she considers her adopted family and part of what made coming to work at, for Metro rewarding for her. Sandra shared that her biggest challenge came the day she was helping a customer in person and they became suddenly quite sick right in front of her. So she's been on the front lines dealing with the public and we appreciate her service and is going to present her with the award. I appreciate the work is being um, a good experience. <laughs> and just happy to be able to stay in a job for 15 years. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Also, uh, who, she's here this morning, Lupe Sanchez. Um, Lupe Sanchez has also been serving with Metro for 15 years. Recently, Lupe has been voluntarily working out of class to cover the senior customer service representative position. She's really stepped up to the plate to help our customer service department address some temporary short uh, staffing challenges. Lupe is a hard worker who enthusiastically tackles new challenges and learns new skills. She says her favorite thing about coming to work is her team of coworkers and the friendships she's made at, here at Metro. When she's not at work, Lupe enjoys spending time with her family. When asked about the strangest call she's ever received as a customer service representative, Lupe, let me get this right. Um, Ever the diplomat says, you get to know a lot of new people. <laughs> <laughs> While the job can be challenging, we appreciate that people like um, 
Uh, Sandra, Melody, Lupe continue to bring their compassionate patience dedica and dedication to the work they do on behalf of our customers every single day. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. Um, I've enjoyed working with Metro for the past 15 years. I've also, um, of course, like you mentioned, um, been happy meeting, um, making friends the current, the, from Paracruz to the current people I work with downtown um, in the Pacific. So thank you. And last but not least, here is, uh, I think I haven't seen him, but I told he's here, is Ed Eduardo Montesino, badge number 584. And he was postponed for, he was supposed to be recognized in August, but he's here, was able to come today. Not here. Not here, here. after all. I'm gonna read it anyway. <laughs> his, his career started as an operator, always committed to delivering the very best possible service in all areas of safe driving, professionalism, and courtesy. His yearning for more challenges led him to become the chair of the United Transportation Union, now SMART, a stint as council member for the city of Watsonville, and then as mayor for Watsonville. Since then, he's been promoted to transit supervisor and is enjoying his new challenges, always with a great attitude. We want to appreciate his service as well. Congratulations to Eduardo. We'll make sure we get that to him. Um, we're going to move on to the next item. I think we have time for this. This is an introduction of a new mechanic, Gabriel Marino, and fixed route operators. Um, I'm going to let uh, Cyril, you want to come up and introduce this large group of people? I don't know how many are here. Good morning, Cyril Geary, operations officer. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, I'm going to have the uh, safety and training coordinator and the assistant safety and training coordinator come up and introduce this class. Uh, we're very pleased to have them. Uh, it's a large class. Uh, it consists of 12 uh, individuals for operators and one mechanic and we're very pleased to have them on board. Great. We're, we're excited to have such successful recruitment. It's just really great. Good morning, board members. Uh, Michael Rios, Assistant Safety and Training Coordinator. Morning, Leo Pena, Safety and Training Coordinator. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, we will introduce um, our mechanic and then our uh, 12 uh, trainee bus operators um, who are almost at the end of their training. Um, they have their DMV appointments next week. So um, we are finishing up the training with our Highway 17s. Uh, we will then take them to the DMV so they can uh, go through their line instruction testing and then be out to serve uh, the public. Um, so we'll start off with our mechanic, uh, Gabe Moreno. Or if you guys all want to stand up, and you guys can line up on this side here, and then we'll have you guys make your way down. Hi, I'm Gabriel Moreno. Welcome. I recently got hired. And I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck in your future here, yeah. Gabe. We're happy to have you here. Uh, David DeMara. My name is David Demara, and I'm proud to be part of Santa Cruz Metro. Glad to have you here, David. Thank you. Darnay Stewart. Uh, good morning. Uh, once, like you said, uh, my name is Darnay Stewart, and uh, look forward to uh, working many years with Metro. And uh, thank you guys again for your time. Great, Darnay. That's a good goal. <laughs> Daniela Leal. Morning, board members. My name is Daniela Leal. I am really, really happy to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <coughs> Thank you for coming to work here. Cindy Farrell. Morning. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much. It shows. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> Bernabe Caranco. Good morning. As uh, you know, my name is Bernabe Carranco. I'm happy to be with Metro. And you know, I've been, uh, <clears throat> I've been learning more about uh, Metro, its mission. So I'm very happy to be with uh, Metro. 
help, uh, how Metro can help uh, the community. Okay, thank you. And good luck with the class. Maribel Negrete. Hello, my name is Maribel Negrete. I'm very grateful and pretty excited to start this new chapter with Metro. So, thank you. We're excited for this big group, too. Thank you very much. Pio Carillo. Morning. My name is Pio Quinto Carrillo. Happy to be here. Glad to be here. Thank Good you luck, guys. sir. Thank you. Thank your career. <laughs> he, was a, he was a past player. Ah. A fellow member, fellow oh, brother. Oh, cool. Yeah. Pablo Martinez. Morning. My name is Pablo Martinez, and I am uh, excited and grateful for the opportunity you guys have given me and my family. Thank Welcome you. to our family. Thanks, Pablo. Michelle Collins. Hello, I'm Michelle Collins. I was born and raised here in Santa Cruz, and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to work for Metro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Teresa Lustig. Hi, Teresa Lustig, uh, originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. So glad to be in California and having this opportunity. Thanks. Glad to have you here. Miguel Avalos. Good morning. My name is Miguel Avalos. Um, I just want to thank Metro for uh, this opportunity, helping to save for a long time. Thank you. We like that too. Thank you. And uh, Jaime Jimenez. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaime Jimenez Neni. I'm glad to be part of Metro. I want to thank you all for this opportunity. Good luck with your job here. Michael, thank you. That concludes, yeah. What a fabulous <laughs> group. Okay. Okay, that's the high note of the day so far, so. <laughs> All right, um, puts us right on schedule. We're here now have a, a public hearing on fixed route free fare program for legally blind customers. Uh, Mr. Clifford, you're gonna introduce this? I will uh, introduce Jamie, who will introduce the topic of our uh, public hearing today. Welcome, Jamie. Good morning. Thank you, board members. Um, this morning, we're asking you to consider public comment on staff's proposal to amend its discount fare program. The amended program would allow legally blind Santa Cruz Metro customers to ride for free. Since introducing our ticket vending machine several years ago, Metro has worked closely with members of Santa Cruz County's Commission on Disabilities <laughs> to address accessibility questions related to the new TVMs. Working with the equipment vendor, GFI, we have addressed many of these issues but there remain enhancements to improve the usage for the visually impaired that our vendor is unable to implement with the existing equipment. While we believe the TVMs meet all state and federal regulations, we do not have the funding at present to upgrade the TVMs to address the enhancements requested. For that reason, we're proposing a free fare program that would allow legally blind individuals to ride for free. Riders who are eligible for the free fare would receive certification in the same way individuals eligible for the discount fare currently do. Currently, elderly or disabled riders qualify for the discount fare in several ways. If you are elderly and you have proof of age, you can come in to our customer service department, demonstrate your documentation, and you'll be given a discount card to ride the service at the discounted rate. If you are disabled, similarly, you can come to our customer service department or call us and we'll send you a form that you would take to your medical provider it would be filled out, you would return it to our customer service department, and again, they would give you your discount fare pass. We're proposing a similar system for the legally blind individuals who would be eligible for this free fare. Legally blind individuals would download the certification form from our website or call customer service or come to the customer service booth. Uh, they could have any medical professional involved with the treatment of their condition sign off, a primary care physician, optometrist, ophthalmologist, etc. They would then return the form to us we would produce a card just like our discount card. This would be our access card that would grant customers access to the free fare program. Santa Cruz Metro would grant the free fare program to any legally blind out of town customer if they hold a discount card. So most uh, disabled individuals have a discount card for the region that they live in uh, that's issued through their RTC. 
if they can produce that, they would be able to enjoy all of the benefits uh, of that our uh, com community of legally blind individuals enjoy in Santa Cruz County. Uh, Santa Cruz Metro would work with customers who may need some time to make the necessary appointments with medical professionals to ensure that they have access to the system while they complete the necessary paperwork for their free fare card. As part of the public hearing and open house outreach process, Santa Cruz Metro advertised in the Santa Cruz Sentinel on September 6th and September 13th in English and in the Register Pajaronian on September 6th and in, uh, and in Spanish on uh, September 13th. We posted notices about the public hearing at each of our transit centers and facilities. We posted information on our website and the public hearings and open houses uh, were also posted on social media. On September 18th, we hosted two open houses at Pacific Station in the morning and evening. Five customers attended in person and provided public comments, all offering support for the free fare policy. We received several public comments via the outreach at SCMTD email address that we created. Uh, as well as by U.S. Postal Service. Uh, we also received several comments in support of the proposal from members of Santa Cruz County's Commission on Disabilities. Uh, they were not able to take it up as a group because unfortunately at their most recent meeting they didn't have a quorum, but several members sent in their comments separately, um, all supporting the free fare proposal. While the comments favored the implementation of the free fare program, they also suggested that we streamline the process um, to make the process as easy as possible. Uh, and finally, we also received a letter of support, which you should have in your pa packet from the Santa Cruz County Seniors Council. If you have any questions, I'm available for comment. Any questions from the board? Okay, thank you for that presentation. I'm going to go ahead and open it up for the public hearing to the public for people who would like to comment. Anyone like to comment on this issue? <coughs> Take your time. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. I'm Catherine Fisher, an attorney at Goldstein Borgen, Dardarian and Ho, a public interest class action law firm. We represent long-term riders of Santa Cruz Metro who have been denied access to its services on numerous occasions because the ticket vending machines are inaccessible to individuals who are blind. Metro's ticket vending machines allow the general public to use cash or credit cards to buy tickets or reload their passes to ride Metro and Highway 17 buses. Metro has five ticket vending machines in total. Each of these machines operates outside of Metro customer service hours, with three of the machines open 24-7 in locations that have no Metro customer service on staff. The machines are the only way to use a card to buy or reload a bus pass when Metro's customer service windows are closed or the location is unstaffed. And this system works if you can see. Folks who can see can go up to one of the five machines, make their purchase, and get right on the bus. But the same isn't true if you're blind. The current machine's audio is difficult to understand, provides incorrect information, and sometimes stops working entirely. The inaccessible fare vending machines violate the Americans with Disabilities Act in California law, and Metro should fix them. Rather than fixing the current machines to make them accessible, Metro has decided to provide the free fare program as an alternative until it decides to replace the machines, which it doesn't want to do for several years. We support a free fare program that's a true alternative to the inaccessible ticket vending machines. But this means that the free fare program must allow blind customers to access the same rides at the same times with the same level of convenience that sighted customers are able to enjoy by using the ticket vending machines. The policy as currently drafted does not meet this standard. Instead, it requires blind individuals to obtain medical certification and go through an application process just to ride the bus. We strongly object to that requirement. No sighted individual is required to schedule an appointment, pay a copay, or risk having to pay out of pocket just to use the ticket vending machines. No sighted person from out of town is expected to travel with the appropriate documentation to ride the bus. 
and the current policy doesn't actually provide any provision for out-of-towners. It's limited to out-of-state visitors. Nor should individuals who are blind be forced to do so. Instead, we advocate a policy that would allow any blind person to board a bus for free without delay, burden, or expense until Santa Cruz Metro fixes or replaces the inaccessible ticket vending machines. What that means is allowing anyone who is obviously blind, who is using a white cane, or is guided by a service animal, or who already carries some form of identification showing that they qualify for the free fare program to board the bus, Anything less than that is not a true alternative to the inaccessible ticket vending machines, and Metro will remain in violation of the ADA and California law. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, microphone, there we go. Yeah, welcome. Is that working? Yes. Thank you. So my name is Len Burns. I have been a blind user of Santa Cruz Metro for almost 40 years. And roughly 10 years ago when these ticket vending machines were rolled out, we became very concerned because we simply could not use them. There has been some limited progress in resolving that problem over that 10 years, but to say that what remains to be done is an enhancement is inaccurate. These machines do not meet standards of state law or federal law at this time. They are in violation of the ADA. We support a free fare program until Metro can sort this out, either by fixing these machines or replacing them. We think that's correct. The policy and the way it's written, that would require us to go through an entire medical certification process when I am quite obviously blind. Notice what's in my hand is ridiculous, and it would place an undue burden on those of us who all ready ride the bus and simply routinely are trying to get our daily business taken care of. That is actually un unreasonable, unfair, and an undue burden upon us. And an undue burden upon us is not going to resolve the ADA issue that these TVM machines present at this point in time. So that is actually not a solution as it's written. I strongly encourage you to rethink the way that you're rolling this out. I'd like to see you do it because clearly there's a problem and we are tired of that problem at this point. But the way you're proposing to do it right now is not going to legally or otherwise solve the problem. It is simply going to lead to more difficulties. I have no need to go to a doctor to go know that I'm blind, and you have no need for me to do that either. It's rather obvious, and with most people who are blind or visually impaired, it is quite obvious, either because of a serviced animal, an identification cane, or a few other possibilities. You are also doing one more thing. You're adding, adding an administrative burden upon yourselves because to administrate that is going to cost you money, a lot more money than you might lose if once or twice in this process if you blind people or who aren't actually blind slip by you. That's happened in this district in the past, by the way. It's rare. It's very rare. You would lose a lot more money trying to run this and set this up than you would by simply saying, okay, if you're clearly and obviously blind, you just get on the bus, you ride free until we solve this. This is a temporary measure. This is not a lifetime thing. It's not a perk, a benefit. It's a mitigation. It is supposed to simplify a situation, not complicate it further. And as it's currently proposed, it's going to complicate the situation further. And that does not meet the measure of the law in terms of resolving the problem that you've had for nearly 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Veronica. Thank you. You're close. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes if it's an inch, it may as well be a mile. Um, I'm, I'm Veronica Elsey, and just for clarification, I'm here representing myself as a fixed route transit user. Um, I, too, have been using Metro for almost 40 years, and I am here to ask you to please not adopt this amendment to your fare structure policy that you have before you. As Len and Catherine said, this is not a perk. So you're basing your model on what they do in Boston, but this Boston model is to accept and receive a discount fare, not to mitigate an ADA problem. We don't have time in this three minutes to talk about what's still wrong with the machines, but they do read the wrong expiration date on our cards. And in fact, they change it. Um, 
and we can't even get out of the volume menu. So it's really important to understand the difference here that this is not a permanent discount fare, but you are still requiring a permanent card. Um, for me as a transit user, what this feels like is exchanging one set of onerous burdens for another. I actually checked yesterday to see what I would have to do to comply. Now, I already do have the Metro discount card, which I got in 1980, but it doesn't say I'm blind on it. Um, in order to do this, to comply, the earliest appointment I could get with my primary care is November. I don't have an ophthalmologist or an optometrist because, frankly, I don't even have eyes. So um, would be November. She would not fill out the form without seeing me because I've been pretty healthy and I haven't seen her in a long time. They will not let me return the form, so now I have to track to see if she returns it to you. Then I have to come down and do what I have to do with customer service and make the appointments to get the card. Also, if I want my insurance to cover the cost of me coming in to see her, it has to be classified as a physical. That would mean that if I wanted to get or needed to get a physical later in the year, I couldn't have one because my insurance only allows one a year. So I could possibly be jeopardizing my medical care in order to fill out a form to tell you something that is obvious just from looking at me. If someone wants an ophthalmologist because their visual acuity is a little more complex to describe, the appointments are being made now for like February, March. And so this is many months before we can avail ourselves of a policy that's supposed to take effect on October 1st. And I think what you saw in the support is everybody was saying, yeah, we support the free fare, but everyone I've talked to is not supporting this complicated, this complicated procedure. So please, Give us back your, oops, we're sorry, we'll take care of you policy, and please let us self-identify, get on the darn bus, and go somewhere. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Good morning, Becky. Hello. <coughs> I would like you just listen listen to the people who spoke before me and and have the do 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 drivers give the the we fair when they board the buses instead of having them have to fill out a form and stuff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Becky. I appreciate that. Anyone else like to come up and speak on this topic? Brandon Freeman, Senior Vice Chair, Smart UTU 23. Um, let's see here, I don't want to go over too much of the other stuff as far as behind the scenes. Um, we're not really interested in seeing any kind of identification for a protected trait, period. So I don't think uh, identification card is a good idea. Um, we can handle it on a case by case basis. You can handle it on a case-by-case -case basis, but another card. Um, disability cards that we have currently for the discount fare, it's very broad. It doesn't specifically say what this is or what that is. We're not interested in knowing what anyone's disability is. We don't ask that question. We don't verify that question. That's not a driver's responsibility. Um, so. I don't think we should go with another card. Additionally, <laughs> I think we've had them for six years. Um, this, the free fare thing and having us, 
decide whether or not someone is eligible for a free ride based on disability. Um, that's not our job. We should not be doing that in the first place. We don't judge people, period. And I understand there's issues with GFI, but it's not our job to fix your mistake with the poor equipment. Um, you need to just get new ones, take them out, fix them, whatever you need to do. Uh, the burden of identifying for a free ride should not be on the driver. It should not be on the customer because it was not us who bought that equipment. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, if the policy were, and I haven't spoken with anybody else, I don't know where we're going with this, but um, if we had this policy that we talked about in place for people who have, let's say, not so obvious disability uh, with blindness, but um, drivers were simply t uh, instructed that if a person had a white cane and or a service dog and were obviously blind, and there would be some slippage, and you, to know ahead of time we'd have some agreement that drivers wouldn't be punished if they made a mistake or something, because that could happen. It would be rare, but it could happen. Would that be a problem for drivers, to just yeah. sort of let somebody on with a cane or a dog? So anytime we have any kind of fair thing, we don't fight over fair. If someone comes in and says any kind of anything, we're just gonna accept it and let them ride. Um, I mean, we do it currently with the Cabrillo passes that we've brought up with Alex. We know that you don't go to Cabrillo. We know that it's three months old. We hit the button and let you ride anyways. Um, we don't get into conflict with our passenger over fare. Um, it does happen, unfortunately, every once in a while, but both the union and management has instructed that we just, we don't get into it. So if uh, something came down and said, you know, in your best judgment, if this criteria is met, go ahead and, you know, press the button on the fare box, let them go. We would comply with that. Um, and that wouldn't be that wouldn't, that be, wouldn't be an issue for us. My biggest issue with the free ride is I don't want them to have to identify or go through any uh, additional steps based on their disability. I don't think no, that's I heard, fair. I heard that, so right. I pre I heard as far as how we time. implement the free ride, um, as long as they're not having to identify, it doesn't really make any difference to us. Thanks very much. We'll just hit the button and go. Thanks for your comments. Yep. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate that. Anyone else like to talk on this topic? So real quick, I just want to give a driver's perspective on another situation that this is going to bring on to us is that, you know, we will have to be using our judgment again if they don't have an identification card or if they do, it's like the next passenger that gets on and say they, they claim they're visually impaired and they don't have their identification. Now we're put in a situation where, you know, do we let them ride? Do we not let them ride? What's going to happen? It's just seems like a very complicated issue and it seems like the honestly the biggest or the best solution to this is to fix those TVMs. These visually impaired, you know, the visually impaired community should not have to go and do all this stuff just because we don't have the, the you know, the machines working. And I understand the, the, the need to regulate it in the sense that we do have, unfortunately, some people in this community that take advantage of these loopholes. But it seems like the best solution, in our opinion, is to fix the TVM so we don't have yet another situation where a driver is going to come across, you know, where they don't know what to do. So I just wanted to give you a driver's perspective. Thank you. Thank you. We, we appreciate your drivers and not police. Okay, so thank you for that. Any other comments? Okay, I'm going to bring it back. And I, I think before I open it up for discussion, I, what my sense is, is first of all, thank you for a great presentation, Veronica and team. Uh, it, uh, Catherine, it, it was great. I think you made a, a good point to the board. And I think they appreciated all your comments and the way you delivered them. And I think this problem needs to be kicked back to staff to meet with you and to come up with a better resolution. But I'm going to take comments from the board. Does anybody would like to make a comment on this? Start with this question. Our intention is to pass this this morning or to do it? No, I, I'm, 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 I'm making a, a kind of a, a plea here that uh, we make a motion to pass this back to staff and have them work with the group and see if there's a better solution that works for the community, the blind, the drivers, and, and Metro in general. So I, I just wanted to, maybe I could ask our attorney, um, <coughs> if, is waiting a month to make a resolution here going to be a significant legal problem for us? Because I think we need to fix this quickly. Yeah, no, uh, waiting a month is fine. I mean, our whole point of having the public hearing in the open houses was to get comments. And so if we hadn't had substantive comments today, it would have been great to adopt. But since we have had substantive comments, it's good for us to take another look at it. 
Okay, so my only comment is to thank the drivers for their uh, flexibility and professionalism and trying to figure out how we might, in the, at least in the interim, resolve this. And uh, at the risk of cutting things short, I'll make a motion that we uh, put this off to next month and ask staff to come back with a different uh, solution than the one proposed today. Second that. Motion by Rock and second by Pagler. Uh, any other comments by the board? Just quick. Uh, when, that, when it comes back, it'd be good to have some idea of um, estimated numbers. I think it's definitely small. That, that's my impression. And the other, just on the service dog issue, um, some dogs are obviously service dogs, and then some people buy the little service dog jacket. And again, it's probably a trivial number, but that's the only other issue that occurs to me. Comments? Okay, I have complete faith in the staff will we'll reach a solution that makes everybody happy. And I, it, we could not do that without the comments that we received today. So I appreciate all those comments. So uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, item 17, consideration. Oh, no, that's uh, what we just did. That's all okay, together. Together. Brooke. Okay, the, we're going to go to the CEO report. Mr. Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Directors, uh, if you don't mind, I'll combine uh, both 18 and 19 together in one presentation. Uh, first of all, I always like to talk about uh, promotions and new hires. In the last 30 days, we have had one promotion. Uh, Monique Dolphin has promoted from an HR generalist to our new HR deputy director. Is Monique in the audience? There she is. So. Welcome. Congratulations, Monique. Uh, I'd like to start off with just a quick uh, update on what's going on on the federal side. Um, not touching any of the controversies on TV lately, just dealing with our transit stuff. Um, FY20 budget, House bill, uh, everything these days is, is talk, talked in terms of plus ups. That is, you have the FAST Act, which created a baseline of funding that should occur for transportation and transit. And then the last couple of years or so, it's been plus ups. How much more can we convince Congress to add to the FAST Act minimum thresholds? So in this year right now, the House has proposed to plus up $485 million. That's pretty substantial. Uh, they would propose $383 million of that to be in the 5339B competitive program where we compete for money for buses. And then another $102 million in the 5339C, which is the LONO program. As you might recall, in 2016, we obtained a grant through the LONO program. Uh, on the Senate side of the equation, they, uh, too, are increasing bus and bus facilities, uh, a slightly less, $470 million in their proposal. And their proposal looks at both the 5339A and B. Now, A is your formula money. So we get formula money, about $450,000 a year that we use to buy all sorts of smaller capital types of items. Like, for example, when we need to replace one of our relief vehicles that the bus operators use to go out and relieve operators on the line, that typically comes out of the 5339A program. So they would, they would increase $390 million in the A and B program and split it 50-50. Uh, I will tell you, I have advocated uh, for money to be increased on the formula, formula side because at least we can count on that money coming in. We can program it in out years. So personally, I like the Senate version a little bit better than the House version. Uh, they too would increase the C program, which is the low no, but only $40 million instead of $102 million. Mm, That one probably needs a little bit of help uh, given it's in the state of California where we're going with electric vehicles in the future. So we want to keep seeing that program come up. And then the Senate did something the House didn't do, which is on the rural program. And we do get some money through the rural program, which is the 5311 program. They would increase that about $40 million. So uh, as you can imagine, it'd be nice to blend these two together. And that's sort of the next stop in the journey. Um, the, the Senate will now go into their appropriations committee to do the markup process and try to reconcile the two bills and come out with something that they can recommend and send to the president. The good news here overall, if you take it at the high level and you look at the funding overall, the 5339, which is the A, B, and C program we just talked about, would get, under the Senate version, about $1.23 billion in FY20. That's probably not an important number. You don't have perspective on that number alone, but it, what gives it perspective is if you compare it to the FAST Act. 
So the FASTAC minimum threshold is 808.6 million. So funding, plusing up to this 1.23 billion is going in the right direction. And remember, the, the beauty of the plus ups and what we have been arguing for, particularly through the bus and uh, bus coalition, is that by plussing up the FAST Act, we're trying to set a new baseline for the future reauthorization next year, right? So we start, we want them to work from the higher numbers to create new numbers, as opposed to trying to just roll over the FAST Act that we had and those numbers, the, eight, the 808 versus 1.23 billion. So all of that will occur in, in the coming days. Um, uh, Congress is also uh, sent to the president for his consideration, a continuing resolution. In this mix is the government's ability to fund itself, and so that has to be factored into this too, and we'll hope that the president signs that. On the state side, uh, uh, on September 20th, Governor Newsom issued an executive order aimed at climate change with a goal of re reversing the trend of fuel consumption, increased fuel consumption, and he's targeting uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle miles traveled, VMTs, and greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And the result of this is, is, as he envisions it, is greater investment in transit, among other things, to try to sort of attack those two areas. So the devil's in the detail. We'll see what happens in the coming days relative to that. But there, there is a substantial amount of money under control of the Cal STA that I think he wants them to consider focusing in this area under his executive order. Um, bills that were sent to the governor that I don't have any word yet uh, have been signed. One would exempt zero emission buses that we would purchase from the state portion of the sales tax. That's a nice uh, jaunt in the right direction. And that would be through January 1 of 2024. Um, as we're buying buses, uh, plan to buy buses in the coming years, that, that's a nice thing statewide. <laughs> and then SB 397 Glacier, um, we offered some input on that. This really had to deal with some things that were discovered in the fires over the last couple of years in which as public transit is being used to evacuate people from those areas, um, in some cases they were not able to bring their personal pets aboard. And so this legislation was created to try to facilitate a discussion statewide about a common policy to recognize that when you evacuate people, you need to let them bring their pets aboard. And as you can imagine, that gets into an interesting discussion about all kinds of strange pets that people sometimes have. So that, that, one, uh, that one doesn't mandate yet what exactly would happen, but creates a forum for some further discussion to occur there. Um, and uh, just in closing on the state side, as you know, and I've reported to you before, uh, I represent this agency as one of the few members across the state on the TDA Reform Task Force. This was a task force created because uh, under TDA, there's a minimum fare box threshold that you have to achieve or you start losing your, your TDA dollars. We are not impacted by that particular performance measure because we have a local sales tax and you're allowed to count this local sales tax in as fare box in that legislation, always has been the case. But what's happened increasingly over the last couple of years is as transit agencies have lost some ridership and they have not been able to pass in their own jurisdictions local sales tax, they're not meeting, a handful of them across the state are not meeting the threshold, the performance threshold, and therefore are in threat of losing their money. Um, so what, what occurred over the last couple of years is these transit agencies started going to their representatives and putting out legislation to get these one-offs done. You need to let us continue to get TDA because this, that, and the other thing. And Senator Frazier, um, uh, Senator Bell and, and Assemblyman Frazier, unless I have that reversed, um, got involved in that issue and said, uh, wait, we don't want to do a bunch of one-offs. Let's look at what is our problem with TDA. So the TDA task force was created. So we're looking at performance measures. Um, I've also entered into the discussion um, the portion of TDA that the RTPAs, the RTC, for example, take off the top. It's unconstrained in administration and across the state in varying ways, I think it's abused. And so there is discussion about um, whether the door is sort of cracked open a little and we go in and tinker with it and maybe fix some of these performance things and maybe a couple other little things. 
or whether or not we go in a much broader way and just break it down and rebuild it from the start, a much more complicated process. Um, either one obviously can result in outcomes that re reduce our funding. So we have to be careful. We have to be watchful of that. So that's all I know on the TDA for now. Um, now, I'd really like to finish on a high note. Yesterday, we completed our FTA uh, triennial review. Uh, as you probably know, every three years, hence triennial, the FTA comes in and reviews us because we are a recipient of federal money. When you receive federal money, uh, strings come with it. You have to follow a whole lot of regulations. Um, just in the way of background, um, federal money provides to us $7.2 million a year, or roughly 14 percent of our total operating budget. So that's pretty significant. <clears throat> On top of that, we compete in the competitive money that we talked about earlier, that 5339B program in particular, and the C that got us the, the LONO money a couple of years back. Um, so we have received capital money at this organization that we're accountable to the federal government for. And then, of course, I talked about the A program in which we get 400, about 450000 a year in formula money. So in order to do that, we have to follow their rules and regs, and they have to review you every, it's not an audit, they say it's not an audit, it's a review, but they come in every three years and they do that. Um, so it's really important for us to get that right. This process, this current process, started about nine months ago. About nine months ago, they send us a note and they say, we're going to come visit you, we're going to do our triennial review, and uh, here's all the things you need to, to get done. So. Uh, Angela and, and uh, Matt from Barrow's department were tasked with starting to work with all the managers and all of their direct reports to begin to pull together volumes of information. This is an this is a every three year thing. It is very time consuming. It is very stressful for us as a small agency because, you know, we're matrix. We don't have a lot of people. We don't have a lot of depth. And everybody is working hard at every level in this agency. They're working hard to get their job done on a daily basis. And every three years, we have this, this added sort of complication. But we got to do it because we like the federal money. Um, so we do it, and we put a smile on, and we get it done. And we produce volumes. Angela and Matt produce volumes of paper, thousands of pages of documentation that they want to see. And then they scan it into the system so that it's available electronically for those folks. Um, and then uh, this year, in contrast to prior years, three weeks out from the, the review, uh, the, the auditor, the reviewers, sent us a 29 pages of additional things that they wanted, that they wanted to make sure we had on hand three weeks later that required a whole bunch of t staff time, everybody dropping what they're doing and getting more information for them. And then, of course, they arrive on, the, on the, our property, and that's a, this year it was a two-day event with one, one single uh, reviewer. Um, so, Here's what I'm happy to report. Uh, after the completion of the process and the debrief yesterday, the FTA uh, Region 9 was on the phone with us for the debrief and the, and the reviewer, um, gave us really glowing comments. They had really positive things. We had two findings, um, but they were very small. Um, they, we have a HVAC system that we have to do preventative maintenance on, and our policy says we'll do it every three months, and there were a couple instances in which we did it at four or five months. We still got four in in a year, but they were not spaced three months apart. That was a finding. They want us to, to show that we're going to do that in the future on a quarterly basis. Really, really minor finding. And then they want us to establish a policy, which Freddie was already working on uh, since he assumed the position of the, the, the manager of that department, in which for facilities and equipment, we have a clear policy about the frequency of that preventative maintenance, the periodic maintenance that we have to do. Again, very, very minor findings for us. Um, in my career of 20, nearly 28 years in this business, I have not seen a triennial review with these few of findings and so minor when they were. Um, it, for this agency, um, this is something to be extremely proud of. They used comments. I wrote a couple of comments that they uh, gave for us. Uh, they, they, they recognized the hard work that everybody at all levels put into the triennial review. They said, we are exemplary when it comes to a commitment and dedication to civil rights. That is no small compliment from the FTA, because that is one area in which they focus greatly on when they come in and they do these reviews. And for them to, to acknowledge our commitment and dedication to civil rights 
is really a really cool thing, I think. Um, they said it's not often that they see agencies with so few findings. They were pleasantly surprised, job well done. Um, they recognized all of the planning that we put into this. Um, so with such a great uh, outcome, we're going to celebrate. We're going to plan a, a nice big lunch for our employees far and wide, wide in the next couple of weeks. We'd like to invite the board to attend that too, to acknowledge our staff for a job well done. Um, and and the, the, the interesting and sort of ironic thing about this is the next triennial review starts today. <laughs> because three years from now, they will review everything back to today. So it, it goes on. We smile and we get it done and we have a great team far and wide from one end of the organization to the other. Job well done. Thank you for that report and congratulations on the trend review. I don't want to minimize it because I think it's a great accomplishment and uh, I think everybody will appreciate the lunch. So that's great. Any uh, questions of the director? Director um, Matthews. Um, I'm just going to take this up. That's an incredible report. I've worked for an agency that has those kind of reviews and man, it's eternal. <laughs> and that's an incredible report. Um, I'm just going to take the opportunity. You talked about the state. Um, uh, policies for reducing um, greenhouse gas, investing in transit and other modes. And I saw Claire Fleisler come in. We just launched the um, TDM program and the bus passes, and she was coming to deliver bus passes. I think the board might enjoy just hearing how that's going because it's going really well. Claire, come on up and tell us a story. That's an okay segue. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, good morning. Claire Fleisler, transportation planner for the city of Santa Cruz. And yeah, it was just popping in, I was going to tell Barrow that I'm physically out handing out bus passes right now and Councilmember Matthews caught my eye. So we, um, as you guys know, we've partnered with Metro on our downtown TDM program that involves an eco pass uh, for all downtown employees. We have about 4,050 downtown employees. They look like this. Our program is called Go Santa Cruz and it also includes benefits for biking, carpooling, walking, information, carpool matching, the whole gamut. We, we call it meeting people where they are. So finding the transportation solution that works for the individual to encourage them to drive alone less, drive alone not at all, carpool with a friend, or do anything else that works for them. So um, as you know, you need to have your pass in hand for it to work. And as we're officially launching this program on October 1st, I've spent this week proactively reaching out to our downtown employers, starting with largest and working my way down the list to try to get the greatest saturation. And since Monday at noon, when I sent out our soft launch email to just a handful of people, we've had almost 100 passes redeemed. And so uh, how, how it works is you redeem it on um, the Cruise 511 application. We're partnered with the RTC on that. You verify that you work in the downtown, and I physically come out and deliver the pass to you. So it's a really, really high touch program. But one of the good things there is many of the people that I'm handing this out to have never taken transit before. And the first question is, what do I do with this? And as we know that that question of even how do I ride the bus? What do I do with the fare box? How do I know where it's going? Is one of the pieces of trepidation that prevents many people who would otherwise be great people to ride transit from taking that first step. And so because it's a high touch program and because I'm physically going out and talking to every person that's receiving a pass, I have the ability to do some education at the same time and also inform them about the other programs that we have. So we're really excited about this partnership. I'm really excited to you know, see the metrics from the other side on utilization and try to get as many of these passes into people's hands as possible. So I'm available if you have any questions about how it's going or anything, but I'm, I'm really excited. Perfect day for a meeting in Santa Cruz, huh? A yeah. perfect day. I just happened to be walking by. <laughs> My office is right up there. Any other, yeah. any comments or questions? No, just opportunistic. Thing. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming up and sharing that. It's yeah. a great program. No okay. problem. If you have any questions during the life of the program, feel free to reach out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments from the board or question? Anyone from the public have a comment or question on the uh, presentation? Okay. We'll accept that uh, report. Uh, Go to uh, next item 20. This is an oral Pacific Station update. Barrel. Good morning, <coughs> Chair, board members, staff, and general public. Thank you. Just a quick update today on Pacific Station, which we will do every month at the board. Uh, just four points. Metro and the city have been meeting recently on both senior policy level and technical staff level and have finalized a game plan for pursuing the funding necessary to make this redevelopment concept a reality. The city and Metro are intending to apply for a major grant 
from the state's Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program in February of 2021. The next year will be spent finalizing design concepts, project features, a funding package, processing entitlements at the city level, and arranging partnership agreements. A draft MOU between Metro and the city outlining the roles and the responsibilities of the two agencies should be coming to the Metro Board and the City Council in the relatively near future. <coughs> That's all I have on this topic today, but would be happy to answer questions. So maybe this is premature and you can't say anything more, but what are we seeking funding for? Ah, I mean, give it, we, we so had, we, I'm going to make started with these sort of extreme. Yes, rebuild the existing station versus go to the city's plan uh, hopes of a much broader kind of redevelopment plan that would change everything down there. So what, what, what right. is and, and I'll try to make this quick. Um, as we have all been talking for a couple of years, there's our current property and immediately to the south or west of us is the Nyack old insurance building in a small city parking lot. The concept is that those two pieces of property or three pieces of property be combined together to create one site. Imagine splitting that site in half with a Pacific fa facing half and a Front Street facing half. On the Front Street facing half, there would be merely a bus surface tarmac. On the Pacific facing half, there would be a building which would feature retail on the ground floor, including many Metro and Sirly functions like customer service security operators. Second story concept is commercial office space that the city is working with and additional floors up are assumed to be residential. There have been pro formas put together about how many different sources of money, including Metro developers, tax credits, et cetera, you put it in a jar and shake it up. And there is a pr concept that has a price tag which can't be met at the moment between the city and Metro's resources. This AHSC program traditionally and regularly and by statute offers up grants to help in the capital construction and in some cases ongoing operations of transit oriented developments. Uh, as I said, staff from both agencies have spent a lot of time in the last two months at AHSC meetings, planning strategies, and we feel like we will be a pretty credible proposal when we have to, and I don't want to minimize, there's a lot of I's and T's and dots to be crossed over the next year because you have to be so many steps down the path of reality and entitlements, environmental clearance, et cetera. But if it all comes together as planned, it's going to be a very competitive proposal as compared to we've, the winners we've seen in the last few years. And the other good news is the AHSC program is getting bumps in its funding levels each of the last three years. And the year coming up, 500 million statewide. The one we're aiming for in 21, 700 million statewide. And there are even carve outs for areas like us who are not large cities whose volume numbers would overwhelm competitors from medium and small urban areas. So I think we'll be in good shape. Thank you very much. I, I'm glad I asked that question because yeah. now I know a lot more about what we're talking yeah. about. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Matthews. I, I really want to thank you, Barrow and others, for putting the time into this. I know um, it, it, it's an ambitious project. Um, it, it does require a lot of work, exploring all the uh, possible resources, the agencies to interact with. It's, it's, it's better than a leap of faith, but it's, it's an investment in a possibility. But uh, to my mind, and I've said this on so many times, has so much potential for improving our downtown and also the metro experience. So I'm, I'm just so pleased that this serious effort is taking place. And we just really appreciate it. Um, and all the signals from a variety of agencies is that we are at a good place in time for policy thought, infill, mixed use, et cetera, and the funding that's becoming available to do that. So. I just can't say enough how much I appreciate the work that's gone into this. Um, I also want to mention, and th this board is all well aware, of uh, another mixed-use project um, a block away that will be coming um, before the city by the end of the year, which is the library housing mixed-use project, which would provide uh, for additional parking um, capacity in the downtown area. Um, both to replace parking that we're losing and to create some additional parking for increased uh, residential density downtown. All of these things, to my mind, 
are part of a whole vision for downtown. Um, that, uh, that proposal, no secret to anyone here, uh, has a degree of controversy, but I think um, the kinds of uses that we're anticipating at the Pacific Station will benefit enormously from the parking capacity that's anticipated in this other project. So um, I just say personally, I'd like to have some indication from Metro that we see the success of the Metro base, the uh, Pacific Station project, um, uh, definitely being affected beneficially by progress on the other project as well. So I'm not gonna propose a motion or anything, but I think that might be appropriate for a future discussion. Director Myers. Um, Council Member Matthews um, uh, covered some of my comments, but I mostly just wanted to thank um, the staff and I really feel like this project has started to really take off and um, we have a huge need and a commitment to build affordable housing in the city and uh, I feel like this is actually going to be a landmark project should we be able mm -hmm. to get it over the finish line. So. Uh, I know it's a lot of work on our side here at the Metro, so it's, I just appreciate the partnership and really the work that's been done over the last, last few months has been, been really encouraging, so thank you. Alex, did you have a comment? Just briefly, uh, Barrow may have mentioned this when, when I stepped out, but I just wanted to reinforce the city sort of brought into this partnership somebody that they hired who is experienced with this particular grant program who has had success over the mountain uh, on the other side of the mountain in San Jose with uh, getting an award. So I think that really helps to give us a little bit more optimism. That combined with what Barrow talked about, the additional money, I think we've got the right target set. Uh, as you know, through this process, through the last couple of years, one of my concerns has been, can that building last mm -hmm. that we get through uh, a grant process? Um, I will tell you that, that Freddie and his teams um, have done a really good job. We've, as you may or may not know, we spent a lot of money recently uh, uh, taking uh, drywall down and cleaning up the inside of the walls and putting new drywall up and uh, searching high and low for where the leaks are in that building. Um, we've spent a good deal of money. The next winter, the next winter will be a good test of that. Um, they've taken a hose, they've shot you know, water at it and tried to make it leak. So far, so good. We'll see when winter arrives, but I'm hopeful that building will do fine and stay dry for that period of time. As are we. Any other comments? Thank you for that presentation. Anyone from the public like to comment on this topic? Okay, we'll bring it back. That's just a presentation. Uh, Barrow, stay there. We're going to do uh, accept the file Metro Planning and Marketing Annual Status Report. Thank you again, Chair. And I appreciate this opportunity once a year to paint the big picture of where we're trying to get to and how we're doing on our path there. So uh, this will be slightly long-winded, but I've worked to make it concise to provide you just the level you need to know and share and, and talk to other folks. Um, and I will be introducing and sharing this presentation with Jamie Ackman, who thankfully is here to lead and create our new marketing department as our first marketing customer service and communications director. Anyway, in this year's annual report, I'd like to touch on six points. Ridership, upcoming bus service initiatives, other non-service major initiatives, our recent onboard survey, priorities for future additional service, and as I mentioned, marketing to support from our new marketing department. First of all, ridership. As shown in the attachments to this report, which I'm not gonna go into, in the three years since our major service reduction in the fall of 2016, Metro ridership has stabilized over the last couple years at just over five million a year. Remember, it was 5.5. So yes, we did lose eight and a half percent over the three years, but have stabilized for the last two years. This is in spite of the national trend of shrinking public transit use. Nationwide bus use is down 2.7 last year and it was even worse the year before. So we're keeping our nose above water. To be honest, our growing UCSC and Cabrillo ridership has offset similar losses in the Highway 17 Express and the other local ridership. As you see, every quarter we give you a report and the details and we explain basis of the uh, background on these trends, be it car ownership, transportation costs, et cetera, et cetera. So we're always tracking this relative to nationwide issues. Um, UCSC with its growing enrollment always has steadily increasing ridership. It went up 2.31% last year. 
and it just goes like that. Um, the success of the articulated bus lease pilot project led to Metro acquiring four articulated buses of its own, and they're out there doing a job to UCSC every day. With the, also, with the fortunate passage of an increase in the student transportation fee in May of 2019, there may be an opportunity for the university to support additional services in the future. They've got things to take care of with their campus services first, but we'll look down the road on that one. Larry, thank you for all your work over the years. <laughs> Cabrillo, in its third year of the student bus pass, ridership increased over 4% over the previous year. Now that may be coming to a bit of a top up, top off, although as I've warned or told everybody before, there's a, a, a strong link between the state of economy and community college enrollments. Uh, economy gets poor, community college enrollment increase. Right now we got the best economy. Cabrillo is struggling with enrollment, shrinking enrollment, which has unfortunately led to a minor reduction this year in the number of school trips they were able to buy of the Route 91X. So it dropped from 22 to 15 trips. But this is an addition. These are school trip only trips. So we've served, they and us are surviving in partnership, a little bit of loss of revenue. We're still delivering what they need. So that's a good story. Highway 17, this over the hill commuter service has continued to see a decrease in ridership over the last three years, albeit at a slowing rate. We only lost 1.7% last year. The Highway 17 behavior tracks a lot like the national use of public transit. But Metro sees a great opportunity to attract additional choice riders to this service through the introduction of improved customer amenities and our newer buses. Number two, upcoming, servi upcoming service initiatives. The primary service initiative for FY20 will be the planning for the introduction of the new Watsonville circulator. Using Metro's first zero emission electric bus, this service will hopefully begin in the latter part of next year. It will start with either our fall or our winter bid. This bus and the services are grant funded and the new service is intended to improve mobility between various local locations, trip generators and origins. So we're really looking forward to that initiative and I think it'll make the, re the key to it, it will make the rest of our five local Watsonville routes function even better. It's the concept of a circle route while all the rest of your service comes in radially, radially but not everybody's going to the center. People are going to places around the edge. It's a proven uh, tactic in a lot of cities. Number three, upcoming major init initiatives. I'd now like to introduce our new marketing director, Jamie Ackman, to discuss marketing activities that will support the introduction of these new services and what comes next for Metro's future. Thanks, Barrow. I get to talk about my favorite thing. Um, so. Let me just sort of start by giving you the big picture. Um, this first six months since uh, joining Metro, I've spent a lot of time getting to know the organization, looking at our long-term plans, and figuring out where I can best fit myself in to uh, have some value. But we also have some tools um, and resources that I've been working on building. So for example, you may not have noticed, but the logo up on the screen is slightly modified from our past logo. That's going to be important when I bring to you uh, later this year, maybe in October, um, but Alex will tell me when, uh, the design for the new zero emission buses, which we've just started looking at internally over the last few days. Um, we are going to be branding those buses with a new look and feel. And that sort of leads me to what 2020 is going to look like for us, because it's going to be a big year, and I want everyone to be thinking in those terms. 2020 is the year we're going to mark our 50th anniversary. And we have a lot of change coming to Metro in an important year. Starting early in the year, we'll, we'll be rolling out our new zero emissions buses and we'll have a celebration event to talk about the importance of these new buses, not just for our community, but for what they mean for Metro's future. Following on that, we'll be launching in early 2020 our mobile ticketing app. In two weeks, we'll be having our kickoff meeting with the vendor we've selected to start that process. That app will form the basis for the marketing program for Highway 17 Express buses because it will be uh, rolled out as a pilot program for the Highway 17 Express buses. But it's an opportunity for us to, to remind the community that it's not just about the mobile app, it's about the service that's available to them. 
and how much easier it will be to use with the new mobile ticketing app. Later in 2020, we'll be rolling out our new real-time uh, app, and that's another opportunity, not just to talk about the enhancements to customer service, but new reasons to come try Metro again, because Metro is moving forward. Uh, and then throughout the year, we'll be doing celebratory activities to reflect on our 50th anniversary, um, including a big community event uh, around July uh, 2020, which is right about uh, our 50th anniversary. Um, we'll be inviting the community to come check out our new facilities. By then, we'll have our new electric charging stations in place at our uh, brand new JKS facility. It'll be an opportunity to talk about what comes next for Metro with our riders and our community. Um, we are engaging in uh, a number of partnership programs, past partnership programs, um, which we're already seeing success from with UC Santa Cruz and with Cabrillo, and now, of course, with the launch of the Downtown Eco Pass. These are opportunities to de develop case studies with riders who've benefited from having access to those passes. Those case studies are really important for people like me because I take them out to big organizations. Like, for example, we're, ta you know, we're looking at whether or not there's an opportunity to partner with some other large employers on similar kinds of EcoPass programs. Showing them the results of those programs and the success that they can have for their employees is going to be really valuable. Uh, and finally, in 2020, we will be conducting our first non-Metro rider survey. We're going to be doing some market segmentation to understand where the future opportunities lie, not just why people aren't riding now, but how much do they really understand about our service and what it can do for them. And with that, I'm open for any questions if you have them, or I can turn it back to Barrow to finish up his remarks. Yes. I have a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, to, we're on TV, and I thought I would be asked this question. The mobile app that you're talking about means that people wouldn't have to have $7 in cash in their hands to get on the over-the-hill route, which is, if I understand it, I ride that. I've ridden that many times. I rode it once a week last year for, for the whole year. Um, it, it not only makes it easier for the passenger getting on, it makes it, you know, you have to fumble around for the 7 bucks, but it also means that you don't have to wait for people to, like, borrow money from somebody else. I mean, the line that gets on the bus slows it down, so it means your bus will be able to get over the hill a lot faster. Am I correct in my understanding? You are. Um, that's one of the reasons that we're actually piloting the mobile ticketing app on the Highway 17 Express service specifically, um, because we do have problems with delays caused by dwell times. And uh, this will help to speed, or we hope this will help to speed the boarding process. But it's also a significant amenity. Um, you know, our uh, customers, Generally, many of them board at the Scotts Valley Station. We don't have a staffed customer information booth there. So this is another way for them to access quickly and easily um, the fares and, and information that they need to get on and get their trip underway. Thanks. Mr. Myers. I uh, just want to compliment you on the, the presentation. It sounds like the year ahead is, is really um, just going to bring a lot of uh, really wonderful attention to the district and um, really remind people what a wonderful um, system we have that they can access. So thank you for that. Um, I'm especially um, encouraged to hear about the, the idea of, of sort of the case studies to try to really engage uh, businesses and others to kind of reorient, maybe look at our services as a way to, to uh, facilitate getting their folks to work. And um, also just very interested in the, the non-metro user survey. So those seems, both of those things seem very strategic at this point in time. So just wanted to compliment you, and thanks. I'm very thankful you're on board. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah that was a nice report. Thank you. Um, and you know how yeah, your brain works while you're listening. Things tie together. So I think the new logo, and I was just hearing a census presentation and their logo, and the whole business of federal funding for transportation and partnerships. So, you know, we I think we've talked about who that's connecting with the census, but I'm just wondering how that ties in with your marketing and partnership thing for coming up. So uh, about a, a month ago, I had a meeting with our um, census representatives for uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey County. Um, we talked through what ways that we can help support their outreach efforts. Um, you should see, for example, uh, beginning in November, um, interior car cards on all of our buses um, that are going to be helping people to understand the importance of participating in the survey. They've also sent us um, flyers, which we'll be uh, putting up at all of our transit centers later this year. So we're engaged in that process. I've also told them uh, when 
we, uh, let's say about March is about the time that their big push is going to start happening. Um, and that we would give them a bit of space in our Headways uh, publication in order to communicate any messaging that they might have. We have limited space, but we'll make about half a page available to them to help communicate their messages. Great. And outside ads on the buses? Is that um, that's a little more challenging because there's a uh, significant cost associated with that. Um, we've talked with them about it. We'll work that out. Yeah. Thank you. Director Rodkin? That's it. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, uh, any other comments? I, I just want to add in, you know, it, it was probably even months ago, possibly even a year when, when Alex presented us with the option uh, to, 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 you know, we, we expressed concerns about having marketing and then this is the fulfillment of that program. And I'm excited that, that you know, where it's at and where we're going and, and the fact that you're excited with the program. And I think this is what, you know, when Alex was selling us on this necessity, uh, it's just good to see it all happen. So I'm excited about that program. Anybody from the public like to comment on this topic? Okay, we'll go ahead and close that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamie. And like you all, I am looking forward to our uh, us just upping our game. Planning and marketing at a small agency is one, one team, one brain, one decision. So thanks for that. So let me move on with a few of our initiatives. And I did want to make one other comment. It's too bad. Uh, uh, Board member Leopold is not here. You would remember that when we were discussing the EcoPass earlier, you said, as soon as you work out the bugs with the city, let's think about the employees on Ocean Street there. So there's the next big employer. So we'll be ready for that one when we're ready. A um, few other projects. Um, we already talked about the AVL and the mobile ticketing. I'll move along. So Pacific Station, I already shared with you in that. So it's the words are almost the same, so let's move along. You've heard that message. Very importantly, the next one is the Unified Corridor Investment Study Alternatives Analysis. Really important to Metro. Metro planning staff will be heavily invested in, the year, the, in this year-long analysis to determine, and this is really important, exactly what it's all about. It's to determine which high-capacity transit mode and or service will be the most effective for the community and the capacity of the county to fund any proposed facility and service while maintaining the integrity of the metro bus system. I know you all understand that, but that's a really important message, and it's one of the key early tasks to look at the reality of available money out there in the world for initiatives like this. Microtransit, another buzzword of our profession. In the second half of fiscal year 20, Metro will propose an on-demand, non-fixed route pilot project. Many transit districts around the country and the world are starting to implement microtransit projects and are developing relations with companies such as Uber and Lyft to supplement their fixed route, while other transit arrangements, uh, other agencies have made arrangements with local taxi companies to supplement both their fixed route and their paratransit services in low demand areas. Another project which we started talking about a year or so ago but for the time being, we set it aside, said we'd come back to it, is fair, restriction, fair restructure and payment media study. With information learned from the 2019 onboard survey, Metro will analyze the potential for modifications to existing fares, past types, and probably most importantly, modernization of our fair payment media. It, it goes hand in hand with our marketing efforts. Next, the 10-year strategic business plan update. Next spring will be the first revisit and update of the initial 10-year plan, which we established last year, the purpose of which will be to review and possibly update the established seven strategic priorities and the many associated key tactical initiatives. Now, on to item four, priorities for future additional services. Given Metro's budget limitations, opportunities for service enhancements are limited at this time. However, if at any time additional recurring, important, recurring operating funding is available to expand service, the planning department sees the following needs as most important following implementation of the Watsonville Circulator. First of all, we've talked about it for a year or so now, Route 35 and 35A up the valley through Scotts Valley and uh, through the San Lorenzo Valley, we need increased evening frequency along the two corridors beyond Boulder Creek. This could be accomplished along with, along with possible improved service along Scotts Valley Drive towards Santa Cruz. These two could come together at some point. And secondly, additional frequency and daily span of service in areas of the county 
like the Capitola to downtown Santa Cruz <coughs> corridor through Live Oak that have transit supported population density and demographics which could create additional ridership. That's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I apologize for cutting you off, but I didn't realize it was a tag team no, coming no. back and forth. So any other questions or comments for, for I just go ahead, Mike. I just want to thank Vero and the planning team and marketing. This is exciting stuff. I mean, it's like we, we deal with difficult problems. We still have a serious difficult problem with SEIU and the contract, but to have so much of this is like this is what transit should be doing, thinking about the future and planning, expanding, and providing people with the service they need to get out of single occupancy car traffic. We talk in the abstract about global warming and climate change, but this is on the ground, and we can really make a difference. And it sounds like we're going to be playing a cutting edge kind of role there. So I, this is, I love to come to a meeting like this because a lot of our meetings are difficult and we're struggling with hard problems, but this is great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I'll open up to the public. Anybody from the public on anything else has commented? Okay, we'll accept that report. And uh, we're going to move on to, this is the, the one that we pulled from the consent agenda. This is item 21A, except uh, the Czech journal, Angela. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll just raise my, no, you don't have to talk. I mean, I really Angela, come on up. I know you like coming up here, okay? <laughs> you know, especially when you don't have buckets or something like that. So go ahead. Go ahead. Recommend. I've just mentioned this one before. It's the last time I'll ever do it. I don't know why we have to see this, honestly. Does, has anyone looked at the Czech Journal? I, I read through it every time, all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, that's a, I know that's like a fetish and an obsession, I, I just, so it's, I'm not it's, arguing with it. It's just clean up. I, Angela, explain to us why we see the Czech Journal. We have multiple... Um, public people that want to see what we're spending our money on. And so this is a very easy, simple way. It's a report that we literally punch the button. Here's the report. This is what we spend our money on the last month. Um, we have instances where we had, um, I don't remember exactly what the words were, but we had uh, hired some goats to clear off some land. And one of the board members was concerned that we were now in the goat business. And we said, no, we're just renting the goats to clear off the land. So there are some things every once in a while. Um, when we have big projects, you'll see in here that there'll be multiple checks to one company. We actually had some board members question that one time. We said, well, it's this project. This is what we're paying. This is what we're doing. And so it, it is informative to the public. Um, I, I hear your comments. But uh, there's quite a few people out there that do like to see what we're spending our money on. And it's a transparency from finance's perspective where we're able to say this is what we spent the public funds on. I was waiting for that transparency yeah. word. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions from any questions from the public on this item? I'll take a motion on this then. I'll, I'll move approval. Second. Motion by Matthews, second by Rockin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I, I got to get you up here at least once, but I think I'm bringing you up again. Um, I'm going to make you sit down. We're going to go to item 22. This is an oral update of the public transportation safety plan. Ru Rufus Francis, welcome. Good morning, board chair and morning. board members. I'm here today to give an update or heads up for the upcoming. A requirement from FTA Federal Transit Administration pertaining to <coughs> Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, also known as PTASP. Uh, this plan is required and by the FTA Rule 49 CFR Part 673. And this rule uh, applies to all transit systems who are recipient of federal funding. And this uh, rule requires that those agencies must develop and implement the PTASP, and that PTASP must be signed by the CEO, general manager, and approved by the board of directors. This is the first time that FTS uh, stipulated this requirement that this plan, safety agency plan, has to be approved by the board of directors. The deadline for de developing, implementing, and self-certifying this plan is uh, July of 2020. So I'm in the process of developing this uh, plan, soliciting comments internally from all concerned departments and individuals. And once it's ready and uh, to be put before the board, I'm planning to have it by December 13th board meeting. So this is just a heads up. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions? Seem happy at this time. Thank you for that. Any questions from the public on this topic? 
Seeing none, we'll accept that oral update. And uh, we're going to move to item 23. Angela, come on back up. We're going to do 23 and 24 together. Good morning. During negotiations, we uh, came up with some pay tables for repair crews and for the fixed route operators. Um, in the past, we've only put forward the pay tables, and we had a understanding of how the pay tables were put together. Um, since then, you know, over the years that I've been doing this, we've always had an understanding on our side, an understanding on the union side, and then as new people were coming in, uh, the understandings were not the same. And so what we did this time is we completed negotiations, and then at the end, we said, okay, here's our pay tables, but here's the process of how those pay tables are put together. So um, over the course of everything, CalPERS now requires that we have a pay table that includes longevity. And so we've included in, in these pay tables, in the documents that we put forward, um, the calculation on how we come up with that longevity. Then we also have pay tables that have certain percentages between the steps. So now we've included in there the exact formula that we use to get those pay tables. Um, I will tell you that if you calculate one way, it's X. If you calculate another way, it might be a penny, two or three off in Y. And so that's why we're putting this forward to the board. We want it adopted. The unions have already signed off on it, saying, yes, they agree with the way that we are calculating it. It is the way that we are calculating it, so we're not throwing something in there completely different than we're doing right now. But we wanted to make sure that future people that come on board and see um, their pay or their pay tables, that they understand how those pay tables were created. Great. Any questions for the board? Are we doing 23 and 24 together? Yep. Yes, please. One is for paracruise and one is for fixed route. Right. Questions? No. Okay. Any questions from the public? Move approval. Second. 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 Motion by Rock and second by Rothwell. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Well, that was simple. Thank you. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. The announcement is for uh, our next meeting will be Friday, October 29th at 9 a.m. at the Metro Office on Vernon Street, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Good job.